We are on Mishnah number 16 of chapter 1. And we're going to meet Rabban Gamliel. And I'll read it quickly, and then we'll talk a little bit about Rabban Gamliel, and then we'll try to understand what his message is. Rabban Gamliel, Haya Omer. Rabban Gamliel would say, Asei l'cha rav, accept upon yourself a teacher, v'histalek min asafek, and remove yourself from doubt and uncertainty. Fe'al tarbe l'aser umadot, and do not give excess when tithing by estimating instead of measuring. So this Rabbi Gamaliel is one of the most important people in, in history. Again, chapter one is dealing with the great leaders of the nation. We started with the men of the Great Assembly, Shimon Atzadik, Antignos, the five uh, partners, Zugos. This Rabbi Gamaliel is an important figure because he is the Nasi. He is the president of the Jewish people, the prince. And he is a grandson of Hillel, Hillel is a descendant of King David, and thus the family of the monarchy is going to be in Hillel's family for hundreds upon hundreds of years. So Hillel, he was the Nasi, and then he was the last of the Zugos. He was the last time where the the Nasi shared the leadership mantle of the nation with someone else, with the head of the Sanhedrin. Hillel, his son, Rabban Shimon, became the undisputed leader of the Jewish people. And his son is Rabbi Gamliel. And his son is Rabbi Shimon. And his son is Rabbi Gamliel. And his son is Rabbi Shimon. And his son is Rabbi Judah the Prince. And his son is Rabbi Gamliel. Which is a little bit confusing because they're all named either Shimon or Gamliel, besides Rabbi Judah the Prince. But they're all named after the grandfathers. So Rabbi Shimon is the son of Hillel. His son is Rabbi Gamliel, the person we're talking about in our Mishnah. If you, if you just take a sneak peek at the next Mishnah, Mishnah 17, it talks about Shimon, his son. And you look at Mishnah 18, it's Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel, Rabban Shimon, the son of Gamliel, which is a different one, which is that Rabbi Shimon's grandson. A little confusing, but we should know that these people are the leaders of the nation. And if you actually look very closely, you'll notice that he's not called Rabbi Gamliel. He's called Rabban Gamliel, which means rabbi. The term means rabbi, but it's a term that is only used for the Nasi, for the leader of the people. All the rabbi, of all the rabbis and all the ravs that we have in this book, only the ones who were actually leading the entire nation were called Rabban, the rabbi, the rabbi of them all. He's sometimes called Rabban Gamliel Hazakin, the elder Rabban Gamliel, because his grandson was also Rabban Gamliel. And therefore, to distinguish, to distinguish between the two, one of them is called Rabbi Gamliel the Elder, and one of them is called Rabbi Gamliel of Yavne. Because Rabbi Gamliel is going to be living, the, the second Rabbi Gamliel is going to be living in Yavne after the temple is destroyed. The current Rabbi Gamliel, or Gamliel the Elder, is going to lead the Sanhedrin and the Jewish nation during a very tumultuous and a transitional time of its history. He dies around the year 50 of the Common Era. Uh, we know the temple is destroyed either the year 68 or the year 70. And leading up to the temple being destroyed, it's a very chaotic uh, time of upheaval for the Jewish nation. Uh, for example, in the year 30, according to most sources, the Sanhedrin itself moved its location from inside the temple to a neighborhood in Jerusalem called Chanut. And then eventually they moved to Yavne. Robert Gamaliel himself, the, I guess, the nominal king of the Jewish nation, even though he wasn't really a king, but for all religious and political purposes, the king of the Jews, he stayed in Jerusalem. But the rabbis are already shifting away outside of Jerusalem. The temple is being corrupted and the Romans are causing all kinds of problems. And there's all kinds of infighting and schisms amongst the nation. It's a very unstable time for the Jewish people. And as a result, a lot of what we see from Rabbi Gamliel and his leadership are about the various edicts that he made. And the reason why you have to make an edict and the reason why there's so many edicts during this time is because the nation is a very shaky footing. And therefore, the leader of the nation has to enact an edicts when they see that it's needed to ensure the Jewish people have continuity. So, for example, uh, some of the edicts that he made are uh, when a man gives a get, a document of divorce. So the man could take the document of divorce, give it to witnesses who travel to give it to his wife. 
The problem is, is that some really, really bad people would f- exploit a loophole in the system to make their wives miserable. What would they do? They'd have a document of divorce given, written for their wife, and they'd send it. She lives in the other neighborhood. Okay. So they give the witnesses, go take it to the other neighborhood. And endemic to this time were bad people. And what the bad people would do is that after they send away the, the witnesses and the couriers to ship the document to their wife, they call a basin. They call three scholars and say, I made a document of divorce, but I want to recant it. And until the document actually arrives into the hands of his wife, he still has the power to recant it. So he convenes three rabbis and they recant it. And the wife, she's so delighted, she finally gets a document of divorce from her crazy husband. She can marry whoever she wants. The problem is she's not aware that her husband, in an evil act, he corrupted the document. The document's useless. And the rabbis didn't know. They, they, what do they know? They, if someone wants to recant their own document, they could do that. They, don't, they have no idea that this guy is doing this all to just mess up his wife. So what does Robert Amil do to avoid this? He says, if anyone does this by the power invested to me by the Jewish nation and by the Almighty, I'm making it invalid. They cannot invalidate their document. And in fact, the way they actually did it, very interesting. The book on the book of Gittin tells us how they did this. How do they do it? He says, very interesting. What is the legal precedence for this move? Says the Talmud. Every time someone gets married by Jewish law, the way the words that they say is Kidas Moshe of Israel, that the marriage is done in accordance with the religion of Moshe and of Israel. What that means is that the governing body overseeing the marriage is the the Sanhedrin, is the governing body of the religion of Israel. That's what someone says. And therefore, if someone gets married. And then they write a document of divorce. And then they recant the document of divorce before it gets to their wife. Says Rabbi Gamaliel, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to enact that the original marriage, which was done in accordance and only with the permission, so to speak, of the governing body of the Jewish people of the Sanhedrin, that original marriage is null. And therefore she is divorced because she never was really married. And therefore she gets the document, she can marry whoever she wants. And therefore, if you're a woman living today, you receive a divorce document after this edict, you don't have to worry of any sort of uh, chicanerous activity of your husband because you know, thanks to Rabbi Gamaliel and thanks to the corruption that existed at his time, he enacted a rule that the marriage is null, not necessarily through the document, but through the annulment of the original marriage in the power vested in the Sanhedrin. Pretty incredible. That's one example of a takana, of an edict that he made. Uh, several more edicts that he made, which really interesting ideas, that we know that on Shabbos, one of the restrictions is walk out of the tchum, of the suburbs of your town. You're allowed to walk wherever you want in your city. But however, if you leave the city, you only have 2,000 amos, 2,000 cubits in all directions surrounding the city. That's the limit of where you're allowed to walk. So I can't walk from one city to another city if I'm leaving the 2,000 amos of my city to get to the other city. However... What if I am a midwife? Hard to imagine, I know. But suppose I am. And I have to go to a different city to deliver a baby on Shabbos. Or if I have to go there because I see a fire and I want to go save the people from death. Or I see a, 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 there's an earthquake in the neighboring city. I want got to run save the Jewish to save the people. Or I have to travel to Jerusalem to testify for the new moon. So these are examples where you're allowed to leave your city because it's so necessary either to save, to save lives or etc. So it used to be what happens after I finish my job, after I deliver the baby, or after I save the people from the rubble, or after I save the people from the fire, or after I save the people from the marauding conquistadors that were attacking them, or after I gave the uh, testimony in Jerusalem, what happens now? So initially, it used to be that you were frozen in place. You had to stand in the same place because once you only were allowed to leave your Tchum Shabbos only to achieve that particular girl. You did it. Now you have to stand in place. Comes along with Gamaliel and says, no, you are now have the status of the people of that city. And therefore, just the people of that city, city that you that you walk to on Shabbos, you can now have 2,000 almost in each direction. Really interesting. 
I want to share an amazing story from the Talmud about his leadership. Because I think this, this story really captures the role of a leader. The Talmud says, It used to be that people suffered more burying their relatives than having their relatives die. We know it's kind of painful if your relative dies. Says the Talmud, it was even more painful to bury them. Why? Because it used to be that people had very extravagant funerals. They'd have very fancy coffins and very fancy burial shrouds. And there was a, uh, they had a huge processions and it was very expensive. And therefore, if you were burying, I don't know, your, your uncle or your parent or your grandparent or whatever, you had a problem because if you had a simple funeral, everyone's laughing at you. What a loser. You can't even pr- provide the necessary send away for your, for your relative. So it used to be, says the Talmud, that people would just abandon their dead. Leave them in the morgue. I don't want to deal with it. I don't have to bury them. Rabbi Gamliel, what did he do? How did a great leader change that? Says the Talmud. He, even though he was fabulously wealthy, he gave very clear instructions. Bury me in the most simple procession with the most simple burial shrouds. I forbid you to have anything most, besides for the most basic garments to wrap, wrap around my body. Simple. And since that point forward, it became a law in Jewish law to only bury people in the most simple shrouds. And therefore, it says the Talmud that there's actually a, there's actually a, a process that we do in the burying of the dead that we thank Rabbi Gamliel for stepping in and saving the nation. What an amazing story! We actually mention Rabbi Gamliel in the Haggadah. Rabbi Gamliel was the one who says that there is three important things you have to remember on Pesach, and that is Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, the three mitzvos of the day. And part of the Haggadah is. Where we quote Rabbi Gamliel, he said that you have to say these three things, you have to ruminate upon these three things, or else you have not fulfilled your obligation. And that's Pesach, Matzah, and Mar, and that is an important point in the Seder that we still do today. When he died, says the Talmud, when Rabbi Gamliel, the elder, died, Batal Kavod HaTorah, the glory, the honor of Torah ended. Because he died. He was the last person who really embodied the honor of Torah. Says the Talmud, what, what, what did he do? In his day and age, when people studied Torah, they did it standing. There's such an honor for Torah. Study. We're studying God's Torah. How can we sit down? Once he died, it marked a spiritual degradation of the Jewish nation. They can no longer study Torah standing. And therefore, his death marks the end of the glory of the Torah. And he is here in our book to teach us a lesson. What is, what is the lesson that he teaches us? Make for yourself a rabbi and get rid of doubt. So it's interesting, if you remember, in Mishnah number six, we had the same instruction. Make yourself a rabbi and buy yourself a friend. And all the commentators are trying to figure out, why does he need to say it twice? We already learned earlier to make yourself a rabbi. Why do we need to repeat, make yourself a rabbi a second time? Various answers given. So the Rambam, his answer is that there's two reasons why you need a rabbi. Number one, to to study Torah from. Number two, to get answers to halachic queries. And therefore, in chapter one, Mishnah 6, it says, make yourself a rabbi to teach you Torah. In chapter one, Mishnah 16, it tells you, make yourself a rabbi and get rid of doubt. When you are in doubt, you don't know to do this or to do that, to do A or to do B. What does the Torah say about this matter? How do I remove the doubt? I asked the rabbi. And the commentaries point out, Rashi points out, for example, even if the person himself is a great rabbi, however, they themselves should have a rabbi as well. Because no one is an expert in everything or the world's greatest expert in everything. And therefore, even the great rabbis, they, they should have someone to ask the questions that they are in doubt of as well. And I was thinking it's kind of appropriate. The very first individual who is the undisputed leader of the people He's the first one in our book to not have some sort of partner that he works with. He was the first leader in hundreds of years whose leadership was total and uncontested. Therefore, how appropriate is it for him to tell us, even someone like me has to have a rabbi, you have to have someone to ask your questions. I have a personal story that I really experienced this by asking 
a rabbi a question, my rabbi a question, and removing doubt. I was uh, 20 years old, and I was dating my wife, Chaya. Now, what does a 20-year-old know? Nothing, right? Little kid. And, you know, we dated for not so long. And, you know, I thought I came very prepared. I did come very prepared. I knew exactly what I wanted to find. I knew how to find it. I was, I was doing a lot of my due diligence. But then we had to make a choice. Am I getting engaged? Am I committing my life to this person or not? And that was terrifying for me because how do I know? Even if I did the best investigation and I verified and I did all my due diligence, how do I know this person is not a pathological axe murderer? How do I know? You don't know that. What happens if you get married to someone and things go south? A lot, a lot of bad things can happen. And we know that our society is not that good at making these decisions, apparently. And I was, I was really worried. How, even if I did everything, all the efforts that I could to make sure I'm marrying the right one, so to speak, there's a million life situations that could happen that could unearth some sort of something. And who is to say that I made the right decision? So I remember I took a cab ride with my Rebbe, Rebbe Usher Ariely. He gives the largest Talmudic shear in the past 2,000 years. Every day there's more than 800 students who gather into his uh, lecture hall in Jerusalem. And I always say, if you have any doubts as to the divinity of Torah, just meet someone like Rebbe Usher Ariely. Someone who has no character flaws. Someone who is just a person that you, they, they're an angel. And like, the, how does this person exist with other earthlings? Like, how, how is it possible to have this human and other humans and they're part of the same species? And the only answer that I could come up with is that this person has Torah and Torah makes a person from a beast to an angel. And that's what it does. And therefore, if you meet an angel, you see that the Torah has that power. I, I can testify. I spent two years, I think with two years and change, going to his lecture every day. And the lecture is, was the most beautiful intellectual edifice you could ever imagine. Everything's logical. Everything makes sense. Everything's done perfectly. Everything's beautiful. There's a bow on top of every idea. Beautiful. And just the ideas and the genius behind it is just incredible. Moreover, in two years, I don't remember him ever fumbling. Ever fumbling. Not even once. Saying, uh, uh, did I make a mistake? Uh, or saying, um, anything like that. Nothing. Just a golden tongue. And gets in there and like, like a machine gun, speaking at a mile a minute, at least that's the way it sounds like at the beginning. And then he starts, and for an hour he doesn't stop, doesn't have to cough, doesn't have to clear his voice, doesn't say um, none of that. Perfect precision beauty, gorgeous. Where does that come from? Like, where does, this, where does such a person come from? Someone whose character and humility is unimaginable. You look at him and he looks, he acts and behaves as if he's just a regular Regular guy, and maybe one of the greatest uh, Torah scholars alive. Simple. Watch him with simplicity. Greets everyone with a, with a beautiful smile. Uh, impeccable, perfect, scintillating Midos characteristics. Where does such a thing come from? It, the only way the only way I can explain it is the Torah is divine. Separate point. But I took a cab ride with him, and I asked him a question, and I felt literally that I had a doubt and it was totally dissipated. It, it evaporated. I, I, I made myself a teacher. I asked him a question and all the doubt that I had in a, a cab ride that took four, five minutes with him from the yeshiva to his house, everything evaporated. Everything was answered. And just if you're curious to know what he told me. So first he told me, he says, I have spoken to thousands of guys and they've all had the same problem and I'll give you the solution. He's like, I have so much experience in this, I can help you with this. He says, you think that you need to make this decision, and the decision weighs on your shoulders, but you're wrong. It's not your decision. You have to do what you need to do. You could only do your due diligence, and if it seems everything is correct, and you're not doing it for any other reason besides for the right reasons, then the responsibility is on God. It's not on you. And poof, all that, all my doubt was gone. I, I remember I had like back aches. I was. I, it was painful because what do I know about life? I'm at 20 years old and I make a decision of what's going to be for the next 100 years. You have to be insane to think that you have all the knowledge to, to make that choice. And the truth is you don't have that knowledge. Only God has that knowledge. 
We believe that the Almighty is the one who coordinates things. And if you did all your due diligence and you did all the right prayer and you really did everything you can, that's all you need to do. And everything else is on God's shoulders. And let him pick up his slack. So it's not his slack, but it's his responsibility. And it's not your responsibility. And like, like a cloud clearing away and exposing the shining sun, boom, there's no more doubt. And, you know, it's been almost 11 years. So far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> what is, how does the Mishnah conclude? The Mishnah concludes with a very, uh, it seems kind of out of place, Description of tithing and not tithing too much extra. Do not give excess when tithing by estimating instead of measuring. What is going on over here? So the commentaries explain how exactly this fits in. When people, when you have, when you, if you have a field, a land, agricultural land in Israel, you have to give 10% of it to the Levite. It's called tithing. Tithing means 10%. Meiser, 10%, which means every 100 bushels, you got to give 10 bushels. Every 10 bushels, you got to give one bushel. Well, what if you want to give 12%? What if you want to give 15%? You could do that, but you have to assign, you have to say this is part of the, I'm giving extra. You're allowed to give extra. However, says the Mishnah, you cannot estimate. If you want to give extra, you have to give with precision. You have to measure. Why? Because if I say, you know what? Ah, this looks like it's around uh, 10,000 bushels. And let's separate this. It looks around like 12%. I don't know. Maybe it's 15%. Oh, I'll just give it all to the Levite. You're actually causing a much bigger problem because only 10% automatically of that goes to the Levite. All the excess, unless you know exactly what it is and you could assign your interest to make that part of the tithe, if you're estimating, you can make a mistake. And if you're estimating, say, oh, I'll just do be- I'll just do more. I have a doubt. I'll just do more. You're causing, actually, the Levite to eat untithed foods. Yes, you're giving more, but you're giving too much more, and now there's untithed food around, and that's a problem. Similarly, when someone has a doubt, so you don't know, should I go this way or should I go that way? There's a halachic question. Says the Mishnah, go to your rabbi. Don't say, you know what? I'll just be stringent. Every time there's a doubt, I won't ask a rabbi. I'll just be stringent. You know why? Says the Mishnah. That's exactly like saying, oh, I won't be precise in my measuring of the tithing. I'll just be stringent. I'll just give more. No, just like when you give more tithes and it's not precise, you're causing all kinds of problems. If you have that same approach with mediating and adjudicating halachic queries, I'll just, I'll just always be more stringent. I cover my bases. That's not true. That's not what the Almighty wants. The Almighty wants us to know what's the, what's the right answer and to be precise. The commentaries point out, maybe you could be stringent with your own money. But if you are, you're a rabbi and they come ask you a question, you say, ah, I don't know, is it this, like that? You know what? Better to just be more stringent. You can say that for your, own, for your own finances, but what about someone else's? The Almighty is very, there's many verses uh, and laws to that effect. The Almighty is chas hamakram al monoshi yisrael. The Almighty worries about our money. He doesn't want us to spend too much money. If he wants, if he ensures that he doesn't charge us too much, we can charge our constituents too much either. And we have to make sure if we're going to make someone have to pay money, let it not be because we just are too lazy to ask the questions. It has to be precise. And thus concludes the Mishnah with this idea, when you have to make a decision and you're not sure and you're not clear, and even though you may be a great rabbi, ask the rabbi and that will help you remove doubt.